Hi, this is Steve Hargadon, and welcome to the Future of Education. It's Thursday, March 10th, 2011, and our special guest tonight is Mitch Resnick. Mitch, thanks so much for coming on. Happy to be here. Really appreciate it. Uh, Future of Education is looking for a new sponsor, so your logo can go there. If you or an organization would like to help sponsor the webinar series, just let me know. Coming up, the Q and ISTE Ed Tech shows. Uh, we have great crowdsourced events at both. The EduBlogger Con, uh, which is held both before Q and ISTE. Uh, these are free events uh, on March 16th in Palm Springs for Q and all day Saturday on June 25th for ISTE. They're a lot of fun. Go to edubloggercon.com. Also, each show has a blogger's cafe and the Q Unplugged and SB Unplugged areas where if you've never presented before, we have an area for you to sign up to present. And we hope you'll take advantage of that. All of those presentations are streamed out live through Illuminate, so it's a lot of fun. Coming up on the future of education, I'm taking a little break because I'm going to the COSIN and Q shows, but after that, two days on education reform. Bill Mathis talks about mistakes we make thinking about education reform, and Frederick Hess is going to talk about his book, The Same Thing Over and Over, also a discussion of ed reform. Then in April, we're going to be looking at local education culture building. Carl will speak on branding during Mints on the Education Revolution. You can see lots of fun activities coming up there. We hope there's one that is appealing to you and you'll join us or come to all of them. If you've missed the show, they are all recorded. Uh, yesterday we talked to John Smith Meyer about uh, SOFIA, actually two days ago, SOFIA.org, the crowdsourced learning environment much like uh, Salman Khan's uh, Khan Academy. Uh, we talked to Kevin Kelly about his fascinating book with technology once earlier in the week, Steve Wheeler, John C.D. Brown, all of those are up in recorded form at futureofeducation.com. If this is your first time in Illuminate, it is participative. The thing I would recommend right off the bat is go to View Layouts and switch yourself to the wide layout. It makes it much easier to see the chat. And um, if you then look at the bottom of the participant window, you'll notice you have some emoticons you can use, a smiley face, a clapping hand, that let everybody know how you're feeling. The hand with the green up arrow lets you raise your hand to take the microphone to ask a question. So when you go to Q&A, you can do that. Um, do be sure to go up to Tools Audio and run the Audio Setup Wizard in advance if you think you want to ask a question, from, question through the microphone. I'll keep track of questions that come up in the chat, and uh, feel free to put your questions during the Q&A in the chat, and uh, you don't necessarily need to take the microphone. So we would appreciate if you'd let us know where you're participating from. Look to the left of the map for a wand with a red star at the end. That's a laser pointer. And cl click on that, and then click on the map. And then feel free to put a shout out in the chat. It's always fun to hear where you are, what the time is, what the weather's like. Fun for Mitch to see who's listening. Look at that sick in bed and still paying attention. But of course, it's Gary Sager. I don't know if you know Gary, Mitch, but uh, there's a Seymour Papert connection there. Sure, I do know Gary. Wherever you're participating from, we sure appreciate your joining us. If you're listening to the recording, thanks so much for taking the time. So Mitch, it really was delightful for me to kind of get to know you through the videos and the um, the papers on your website. I found myself almost cheering aloud. I actually tweeted a phrase from you today. Uh, the, uh, the education reform needs, I'm not saying it right, we need to reform education reform. I found that so pertinent. And I think that was from a chapter in a book that you wrote uh, maybe eight or nine years ago, but it felt like you could have written it today. Yeah, well, the same struggles continue. So could you give us a little bit of uh, background on um, you know, who you are and, and how you've gotten to where, where you are now? We'll, we'll dive into each of your projects, sort of doing an overview of a, a Mitch Resnick 101 tonight. Um, but I think it might be interesting for people to get a sense of your background, and uh, in, including your journalism. 
Right. Um, well, let me start off by saying, you know, right now, I'll stay where I am now and then I'll look backwards. I'm a professor at the MIT Media Lab where I lead a group called the Lifelong Kindergarten Group. And I think that name captures some of the spirit of what's most important to me. We call it, I call it the Lifelong Kindergarten Group because I've been inspired by the way children learn in kindergarten. But what is it about the way children learn in kindergarten? Is that kids in kindergarten are constantly you know, designing and creating things in collaboration with one another, whether they're you know, building you know, uh, blocks into towers or making pictures with finger paints and crayons. They're always playfully making things you know, together with one another. And I think a lot of our best learning experiences happen that way when we're actively designing and creating and experimenting and expressing ourselves. But it's unfortunate that that happens in kindergarten and we often don't let it continue through the rest of our lives. So what I've been committed to is to see how can we take that type of learning experience that works so well in kindergarten and see how can we extend it through our whole lives. And I think it's something that's been important to me through my whole life. You know, as, as I started out when I was in college, I majored in physics, but I decided as I was graduating that really what I wanted to do was to be able to share ideas and express my ideas. So I spent a number of years working as a science and technology journalist, writing about science and technology. Because I think for me, the idea of helping people understand things was always very important to me. So journalism was one way of helping people understand things. Uh, but after I worked as a journalist for about five years, uh, which was a, it was a great opportunity. I was doing this in the late 70s and early 1980s when personal computers were first coming out. And I was writing about all of the exciting possibilities of these new technologies. But sometimes when I was writing about it, I started feeling, well, maybe I'd want to be doing some of those things of developing some of the new technologies. And I also started to recognize how these new technologies would provide a new opportunity, a new way of helping people understand the world around them. So I shifted from my work in journalism to thinking, how could I use new technologies to help people understand the world around them? And I was lucky enough right at that time in the mid-1980s to meet Seymour Papert, who is a huge influence in my thinking. Because, you know, as, you know, the idea that Seymour had of the, one of the best ways for people to make sense of the world is to be designing and building and creating things in the world. It really resonated with me. It's the way I had learned many things when I was growing up. You know, even from early years, I remember growing up, I was always making things. I remember one summer, I dug up our backyard to make my own miniature golf course. So I wasn't just interested in playing games, but designing the games themselves. So it was always important in my own learning and I wanted to share those, that approach with other people. And I saw the opportunity that new technologies would make it possible uh, to let everybody become more of a designer and a creator and to learn about the world by designing and creating things. It seems like there's this really interesting tension between the computer as an information device and the computer as a creative device. And I think somewhere you must have said or I read that, that computers got into the schools early on with Papert and Logo in a very creative form and that they kind of plateaued and that that didn't become the predominant use. Am I reflecting that accurately? Yeah, I think that, that is true that you know, back in the, again, early 1980s, one of the main ways personal computers did get into schools was through, uh, through the use of the Logo software that Seymour and others developed. Uh, and it really was using the machine as a way to express yourself. But even back then, there were these you know, different strands of thought about different ways of using the computer. Uh, increasingly, I think you know, the computer got brought into the mainstream ways of thinking about learning and education. Uh, so in my mind, what's most important that we need to do is not just to rethink technology, but rethink the way we you know, can think about learning and education. Because too often when people think of learning and education, they think of it in terms of delivering information uh, to the learner. So traditionally, people have thought about education in terms of a teacher delivering information to students. And as the computer came out, people, as personal computers you know, became more accessible, people just stuck with that same paradigm. And they thought, well, we could use the computer to deliver information. So I think to a large extent, computers in a lot of educational settings 
have just fit right into the predominant paradigm of delivering information to the learner. You know, I don't think it was meant ironically, but in the movie Waiting for Superman, there's actually a graphic of a kid's head being opened and information being poured in. Yeah. And, and those of us who watched that with a critical eye uh, thought that was so reflective of sort of this larger view of, of what actually happens in education. So you use the term constructionism. And uh, is that a term you still use to kind of describe that philosophy? Right. Well, again, that was a term you know, that you know, Seymour Papert coined, uh, and I do think it captures you know, important elements of, the, of this approach to education and learning, uh, where I think one of the things that Seymour would say is that some of our best learning experiences come when we're actively engaged in designing and creating and constructing things, that we construct new knowledge best when we're constructing things that we can share with other people. Uh, I remember you know, we sometimes even just the language we use, you know, is important. We, we shouldn't think about getting ideas. We make ideas. We actively make ideas, and the best way of making ideas is by making things. And it doesn't have to be making physical things. You might be making things on a computer screen. You might be making a story, making a poem, but actually making things that you can share with each other. I think is an you know, is is at the core of some of the best learning experiences. And actually, I, let me add when you mentioned. Waiting for Superman. I do remember that graph in the, that graphic in the movie. But one of the things that struck me about the movie is that for a movie about education, there was so little in that movie about the approach to education, uh, about what is the approach to learning. And to my mind, one of the most important elements to trying to change what happens in the educational system is to rethink the learning approach in the classroom. So it's frustrating to me that that movie. It was talking a lot about organizational structures of schools, but said incredibly little about what actually goes on in the classroom, which in my mind is incredibly important. We've talked about this a lot on the show, and I'd be very curious to get your perspective on it. it you know, obviously, this is not a new story. There have been a lot of people who have built really great schools around some progressive education ideas and actively involving students in their own education, um, but it always seems to be a fringe story. Is that because it just takes deeper thought to get to that place, and so it's never going to be the, sort of the common public narrative around education? Or do we have opportunities, do you think, to actually make that fringe more of the core? Okay, well, I, certainly I think we have a chance to make it the core, but it won't come easily. Uh, I think that the, 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 they're, they're, uh, we all have to work hard to shift people's mindsets. Because I do think we have to shift the way people think about education and learning. And that doesn't come easily. It's you know, deeply entrenched in the culture. But I think it's possible. And I do think new technologies provide a way that could help us in shifting those mindsets. I think you know, in some of the approaches to progressive education, of course, there have been ex examples that have been very successful, you know, as you point out. But one thing that's made it difficult to move into the mainstream is we haven't had the right tools, media, technologies to allow this type of constructionist, project-based approach to be used throughout the curriculum. I think that one of the most important things about new technologies is that they provide the opportunity to take this approach to learning and apply it to a wide range of different areas. Uh, and this is where, getting back to my idea of the you know, lifelong kindergarten, in kindergarten, we do have the right materials. We have wooden blocks, and kids learn about structures. You know, we have finger paint. They learn how colors mix together. So in kindergarten, when you want to learn about number and shape and size and color, we have the right materials, the right media to help kids learn by designing and creating things. But as kids get older and they you know, want and need to learn more advanced ideas and work on more sophisticated projects, if all you have are wooden blocks and finger paint, you're not going to be able to do, you know, to learn the more advanced ideas and work on the more advanced projects. And that's one of the reasons I think that schools have shifted back to the delivery approach to education, just trying to deliver information. But I think if we use new technologies the right way, we can extend that kindergarten approach of designing, creating, expressing yourself to learners of all ages to allow people not just at, you're at five years old, but at 10 years old, 15 years old, 50 years old, to be able to use the computer 
to design and create and learn through that process. So I'm wondering if that actually makes this a fairly critical moment. Uh, it feels like Web 2.0 kind of opened the door to using the computer as a creative device to people who were not necessarily scientists but more in the uh, liberal arts. Um, and yet at the same time, we feel this push for Web 3.0 where the computer will make decisions and deliver certain information to you. Like now, I no longer trust the Google search results because I know they're customized to me, so I no longer have a context for them. It, it's hard to see them objectively because I, it, it, when I search for something, I don't think that the same results are going to someone else who searches for something. So does that make this kind of a critical moment to stand up for providing opportunities to use the computer creatively rather than having the computers make decisions for us? Yeah, I, I do think it's critically important to think, you know, you know, where is the, the, where is the agency? We sometimes use the word agency to say, you know, who is it that's making the decisions? Where's the real, the core of the activity? And for me, like when I talk to parents about what type of electronic, you know, what type of new toys might they get for their kids? For me, one of the important ways of thinking about it is, you know, who is it that's in control? Is it, is it the toys allowing the kids to design and create? Or is the toy in control? The toy doing very sophisticated, interesting things, but the kid is just watching or just pushing buttons. So I think it's really important, whether it's with you know, toys for kids or all things that we do with new technologies, you know, to, to think carefully about is it empowering people to express themselves and to let people do the designing, creating, experimenting, expressing, or whether we're just relying on the computer uh, to, to try to, to, to deliver the, the, those ideas to us. Uh, and I do think there's an important fork in the road there. So some of what you're saying is reminiscent of an interview we did with John C. D. Brown just a couple of weeks ago, who uses that same phrase, the same word agency. Uh, and also, I'll make another connection in a minute. So could you tell us a little bit about Programmable Bricks? What, what it was that project and wh where does it sort of live now? Right. Well, we, we, I've been very fortunate for the last 25 years now to have a close collaboration with the Lego toy company. Um, and you can see, since we really believe in the best learning experiences come when you can design and create, there's a natural connection with Lego, which makes you know, different materials that allow people to design and create things. So you know, I think we've had a real you know, sort of, uh, a shared you know, spirit with the work we do and the work at the Lego company. But we've always tried to stretch it in new directions. So the same way, well, I think it's great when kids grow up building houses and castles and towers with Lego bricks, they learn a lot in the process. They learn about what makes things stand up or what makes them fall down. Uh, but we want to go beyond kids just building structures. And we thought that if we connect it to you know, the computer, we can allow things to come alive and interact and communicate and would open up a new range, it would broaden the range of what kids could create, but also broaden the range of what they could learn. The very first step that we took on that was actually back all the way in the late 1980s. We worked with the Lego company on a product called Lego Logo. So it combined Lego construction in the physical world with the Logo programming language. So you could build something in the physical world, uh, you know, you know, say a windmill, a, a windmill or, a, a, or a, an automated factory line, and then on the computer write a logo programming, a logo program to control the physical object you built with Lego bricks. So we saw that as a great experience for kids, and you know, kids loved it, and we saw them learning a lot because they got to design in two different worlds: to design both in the physical world, but also design the behaviors in the programming world. And in the process, they learned deeper ideas about the process of design itself. But it was still using the computer connected to your Lego construction. So as a next step, we thought, as electronics gets smaller and less expensive, why can't we take the computer and basically bring it and jam it inside a Lego brick? So that was the birth of programmable bricks, it was basically trying to take a computer, oh, I see the lights just went out in here, so I'm going to try to there, get the lights back on. Um, the idea was to take the computer, put it inside of a Lego brick, so you could then build your computer directly into your Lego construction. So if it built a creature, I could build the computer right into the creature so the creature could move around. I could put sensors on it so it would detect if it was 
bumping into something or it could you could direct it to move towards the light. So we had a way the program of bricks allowed us to put a program in a Lego brick so it could then get information from sensors and control motors and lights and sounds. So that work ultimately led to the product Lego Mindstorms uh, that is a robot construction kit that the Lego company has been selling for the last 10 years or so. And it's been very exciting for us that that got out to the world so millions of people around the world are now able to make use of these programmable bricks to build new types of things and learn new types of things. So, so how does that relate to the cricket? So after we worked on Lego Mindstorms, we thought it would be nice to make the program brick even smaller and to connect it to more different types of things. So we developed the cricket as a research project here at the Media Lab. There was a smaller programmable brick, so it made it more mobile, so you could make it wearable. So we had kids do things like, I remember we did a workshop in Hong Kong where there was a girl who had, she had, she had seen that on some running shoes there were, uh, you know, that lights would light up as you would walk in your running shoes. But you didn't have any control over how the lights light up, lit up. So she decided that she wanted to put lights on her boots. So she took a cricket, attached it to her boot, and luckily it's small enough and light enough that you could just put it right on the boot connected a sensor that could detect how she was walking, then had colored lights that she put along her boot, and then wrote a program that said, based on what the sensor read about your walking, it would turn on the lights to different colors and different patterns. So that was a way that she was able to make her own fashion statement and sort of build her own wearable technology using it. So kids have used the crickets in all sorts of different ways, from everything from those wearable technologies to a security system for their room. So if someone enters the room, it turns on an alarm, to making an alarm clock to wake them up in the morning. So all sorts of different inventions. So we saw it as a toolkit for creative inventions. OK, so knowing that you have a lot of projects and we want to kind of give people an overview of all of them, uh, now could you tell us about the computer clubhouse? Okay. So in fact, it's a good connection because the Computer Clubhouse actually got started with a connection to our work with programmable bricks. Back in the early 1990s, as we were doing our very first experiments with programmable Lego bricks, we wanted to try it out with kids, as we often do, you know, with, as we develop new technologies. So we went to a local museum during a spring vacation week, and the museum let us set up our prototype technology, uh, and kids would come in and try out our tech, these programmable bricks. And I remember they did everything from you know, automated assembly lines to different amusement parks. So the kids had a great experience. We learned a lot. At the end of the week, we took the technology, we brought it back to MIT. But an interesting thing happened the next week. The museum called up and they said, kids are coming back after school and they're saying, where's the Lego stuff? And the fact is they talked to the kids it turned out the kids were sneaking into the museum because they didn't have money to get into the museum. And we found out these were kids who were just getting in trouble after school, but they wanted to come back and keep working on these Lego programmable brick projects. So we saw a great opportunity and a great need that for a lot of young people, they were interested in using new technologies for creative learning experiences, but they didn't have any place to go. And without those opportunities, they were just getting in trouble after school. So we, we, we felt we needed to find a way to let these kids continue working on these experiences. And it wasn't enough just to give them free admission to the museum, because museums aren't really set up for kids to work on those types of projects. So we needed a new type of space. And we looked around, and some of the community centers did have computers, but they weren't using computers in that way. And some of them, they, you could take a course of how to you know, work with spreadsheets. At other places, you could go in and play games. But there weren't places that allowed kids to use technology for, as a create, for creative expression, to make your own videos, to create your own music, to do your own robotics. So we felt there needed to be a new type of place. So we started the first computer clubhouse. This is all the way back in 1992. 
as a place where young people, specifically young people from low-income communities, could come in and have an opportunity to learn to express themselves creatively with new technologies. So we started the first computer clubhouse in Boston, and then we opened up a few more in boys and girls clubs in Boston, and then we were very lucky to form a partnership with Intel, who provided support to expand this network of computer clubhouses. So now there are more than 100 computer clubhouses in 20 countries around the world. And it's a place where even though the technology has changed a great deal in the last 20 years, there's still the same needs and need for young people to get together, not just for access to technology, but to access to people who can help them learn to use their technology in creative ways. So you've raised a really interesting point for me, and, and I want to get to Scratch, and I know we'll spend some time on Scratch, but um, this alternate way of thinking about technology for constructing, for making videos instead of downloading them, or making games instead of just playing them, um, are there good ways of measuring the success of this kind of education? D d um, or, or is it okay to search for a metric that would say that this actually produces an outcome that's better? And do we have those kinds of metrics? Well, I think the first thing one needs to do is decide what are the goals of education. Because, you know, if the goal is, you know, how to learn to add fractions better, you know, that's one thing. We could measure whether the technology lets you add fractions better. But for me, what's most important is, you know, I think the three outcomes that we see as most important is we want young people to learn to think creatively, reason systematically, and work collaboratively. Because we feel that success and satisfaction in today's society is going to depend on being able to think creatively, reason systematically, and work collaboratively. So I think those are the things that we want to assess. And in some ways, it's often harder it's more difficult to assess some of those things than it is to assess whether someone has learned how, you know, their multiplication tables. Uh, but there are ways we can start to look at that. And I think there's, it's a good area for people to put more work into what are the ways that we can, you know, evaluate how well people are learning to think creatively, reason systematically, and work collaboratively. We've had Yang Zhao on the show and talked about how uh, you know, our perception of Asian education and sort of the Sputnik moment kind of argument um, and how he, he's communicated, and I think you have as well, that oftentimes the educational leaders in these countries are trying to figure out how to get that creativity into their education system. But maybe that in part answers the question of widespread adoption, because if it is hard to find ways of measuring that, then it, it becomes a harder and more difficult um, sell to uh, talk about shifting to that uh, system. So have other countries that you've watched done that well, and have, is there a clue there as to how you communicate that more broadly? Yeah. Well, one thing I'd say is when you mentioned you know, countries in Asia, I do think when I give talks in Asia, I think there's often a real interest in these issues because there's a greater recognition there that their educational system generally does not support the development of creative thinking. And they're aware of that. And they're starting to recognize that that's a real limitation. Uh, so, you know, I've gone, you know, in many different countries in Asia where there are people who, and especially in the business community, I remember, you know, visiting in Singapore and business leaders who would say that even though the Singapore schools, you know, scored at the very top on the international math and science exams, when the graduates of those schools came to the workplace, they weren't being successful because they didn't know how to think creatively. So the first time some unexpected thing happened, they didn't know what to do. They were very good at carrying out the rules that they had learned, but they hadn't learned how to adapt to the new and unexpected situations. And in today's society, if one thing is for sure, is that we're going to be faced with new, surprising, unexpected situations. So I think there's a growing recognition that we need to help young people develop as creative thinkers so they're, they're able to come up with innovative solutions to the unexpected situations that we know will arise. So I think increasingly people are aware that this is a need. And I think especially in Asia, they know that their school system is not well set up for that. Again, there's still challenges about how to make the transition of how to change the education system 
so that it is better suited for that. And you can see there's often a tension there. I remember visiting uh, you know, in Singapore where, as I said, that there was this recognition from the business community, the government community, that things needed to be done differently. And they took me to a school where they were using some of our robotics kits. And I saw young people doing very creative projects with these robotics kits. And I went to one of the teachers and I was curious. I said, I was, you know, how is it that you've integrated these robotics activities into the classroom? And she looked at me like I was crazy and she said, we would never use this in the classroom. The classroom must be for drilling all the exercises. This is only done after school. And for me, that was really illuminating. Even though at high levels there was a recognition of the need for change, you know, they were still holding on tight to their traditional ways of doing things in the classroom. Uh, and it's, you know, just, it's difficult to make those changes. Are there schools that you've seen, maybe here or abroad, where you feel like somehow they've created a culture that's, that really looks at creative thinking, reasoning systematically, and working collaboratively? And are there any clues as to what, what those individual school cultures have done to help make that a reality? Yeah. yeah. Well, certainly there, there, there are lots of individual schools. And I think what distinguishes them is the people, having leadership of the schools that has a clear vision of what they see as important, about the goals that they see as important for education, uh, and, then be, and then having the flexibility to you know, make changes in order to accomplish those goals. A lot of times those changes involve breaking boundaries or crossing boundaries. So trying to break the boundaries between disciplines. So rather than having separated math class, science class, social studies class, work on projects that cut across those boundaries. Also breaking down the boundaries between ages. So it's not just second grade, third grade, fourth grade, fifth grade, but having older kids work with younger kids and learning in both directions. Also breaking down the boundaries between inside of school and outside of school. So having activities in the community influence what's going on inside of the school. Inviting people from the community into the school to share their experiences and to help. So I think there are all sorts of boundaries that need to be you know, crossed and barriers that need to be broken, both between disciplines, between ages, between inside of school, outside of school. I think some of the most successful you know, places that I've seen have been able to you know, break those boundaries to open up new experiences. Yeah, it was uh, the connection I wanted to make with John C. D. Brown was his idea that you uh, you combine structure and freedom. Uh, that he, he uses the the word culture to indicate two different ways of thinking about uh, how things happen. One is the culture that's sort of stable and solid, that uh, like our our national culture, and the other is culture like in a petri dish that grows sort of wildly in the combination of the two. And it sounds like uh, with your um, at a computer clubhouse that you found a way to kind of provide the boundaries and the, the freedom, and then that's sort of the key in a school environment. Well, I definitely agree. This combina finding the right combination of structure and freedom is critical to all of education. You know, I sometimes say what you need is you want the freedom to allow people to follow their fantasies but enough structure and support that they actually will succeed in following, following their fantasies. Uh, and I think with clubhouses, we oftentimes you know, try to set up the clubhouses to be different than traditional schools. And sometimes people would start to refer to computer clubhouses as unstructured. And I never liked that because it's not that it's unstructured, it's differently structured. There's still structures there. We made lots of choices like, what type of software to have there, what type of materials, how to arrange the room. Those are all structures. Uh, so there's, there's plenty of structure, but just different types of structure that could then be used to support people, you know, you know in, and allow people to work freely within those structures. So I think designing, whether it's a curriculum or a class or a space, it's always a matter of developing some structures to reflect the values that you have for education but then giving a lot of freedom and agency to allow the learners to explore their own ideas within those structures. Okay, so we've got maybe 10 minutes before we'll switch to Q&A. But tell us about Scratch, because I think most, most people who will know you, more people will know you from Scratch than anything else. 
So actually, Scratch also you know, has a link to our Computer Clubhouse project because we saw that as kids were creating things at Computer Clubhouses, there were a lot of tools that enabled them to create videos or create music. But a lot of kids wanted to make interactive stories, interactive games, animations, simulations, but there weren't good tools for them to do it. Of course, you could learn a programming language like C++ or Java, but that wasn't going to be easy for these kids, and that, that wasn't a path that was, you know, that was readily available to them. So we saw that there was a real you know, demand. The kids wanted to make interactive stories and games and animations, but they didn't have a way of doing it. And we saw there was a real great learning opportunity you know, if we could provide the right tools to let them do that. And we've been very influenced by the work on Logo, you know, starting from Seymour Papert's work many years ago. We were also inspired by work that Alan Kay was doing uh, with a system that was called eToy that allowed kids to program media and manipulate media in different ways. So there are a lot of ideas out there. And with Scratch, we tried to bring those ideas together to make a much easier way for kids to design and create their own interactive stories and games, and then importantly, share their creations with one another. Because again, the work collaboratively is an important part of it. So from the beginning, we thought of Scratch as partly making programming more accessible. With traditional programming languages like Logo, there sometimes were some challenges that kids would run into with you know, the syntax of where to put the square brackets or the, or the semicolons in, in, in traditional programming languages. We didn't want that to get in the way, but we still wanted the kids to be able to have a rich way of expressing themselves. So we made a more graphical approach to programming to make it more, to get rid of some of those syntax problems. We also want to build on kids' interests. And we saw the kids were really interested in manipulating media to bring together photographs and graphics and music and sound. So we made it very easy for kids to bring in different media and then to program that media. And then also we want to make it more social. We knew a lot of the best learning experiences would come when kids could share their creations and learn from one another. So right when we released the Scratch software, we also released the Scratch website, which is being shown there now. So that's a web and online community. It's a little bit like YouTube, but instead of uploading videos, you upload your Scratch projects. So now kids create their interactive stories, games, animations, and then share them on the Scratch website where other people can play with their creations, give them feedback by writing comments, and even take their creations as a starting point to, make their, to extend to make their own projects. So the website provides a way that it's, it's an audience for creators where they, there's a way people to get other people to, to try out what they've done and give them feedback. And it's also a source of inspiration where people can look at the website and get great ideas. You can see there on the website that since we released Scratch uh, three to four years ago, there have been more than 1.6 million projects that have been shared by kids around the world. Right now, every hour, there's more than 100 new projects that are shared. Every day, several thousand projects. But the numbers isn't what's most important. What's been most amazing to us is the diversity of projects. Kids are using Scratch in so many ways we never imagined. So just seeing the creativity bubbling out of the Scratch online community is just amazing to us. As it goes on, you get to see even greater creativity and sophistication as kids build on each other's work. Of those projects on the website, about a third of them are what we call remixes, where kids are starting with someone else's project and then building on top of it. So they're learning from what others did and then adding their own creative element to it. Uh, so we really feel that in Scratch we are seeing kids you know, be able to think creatively, reason systematically, and work collaboratively. So am I right in thinking that the default for publishing a Scratch project is uh, with a Creative Commons license? It's, it, it's not only the default, it's the only way of publishing. Uh, so everything you publish on the Scratch website, automatically you're agreeing that it'll be covered by Creative Commons, meaning that other people are allowed to make use of it in their projects. Uh, now, of course, we encourage people to give credit when they you know, are building on someone else's work. But we, we really wanted to make sure that uh, 
everybody would be able to share. And we've done a lot to try to create a culture in the Scratch community where sharing is seen as a virtue, that you should feel proud if other people are remixing your projects. So and I think that you've also talked about using Scratch uh, as the first step in learning programming, even at higher levels, right? You know, one thing that surprised us was, we, although we designed Scratch for ages 8 to 15, Scratch has been used quite a bit uh, and more, it, it, with, with older students. There are quite a few universities who are now using Scratch in their introductory computer science class. Uh, at Harvard, just a couple miles from here, they use Scratch for the first few weeks of their introductory computer science class, and they found that fewer people dropped out of the class uh, because, and I think the reasoning was that people could more quickly see, you know, interesting things to do with programming. They didn't have to slog through learning, you know, a lot of the syntax. Right away they could see things that were exciting for them to do, and then they would switch over to a uh, more traditional text-based programming language. Actually, in Berkeley, they use a version of Scratch for an entire semester of their introductory programming class. Uh, so Scratch really is getting used at all different levels, from elementary school through university and even beyond. Am I right in remembering a couple of years ago that there was actually a graph of the age of Scratch users and there was this big bump in the 30s or early 40s? Was there some kind of high usage of older people that was unexpected? Uh, actually, I don't think there's a big bump, but there is a long tail. Uh, there's a big bump with a peak at around age 13, and it does slope down. Uh, uh, but then it's a pretty sort of stays at a pretty constant level, like through the 20s and 30s. And I think that's partly as young teachers are using it, young as parents are, are you know are making use of it. But also, it's not just using it with kids. We do see people in their 20s, 30s, and beyond, you know, using it, you know, for their own creative expression, making an interactive birthday card for a friend. Uh, so there are all sorts of ways. The same way that we saw with Lego Mindstorms, there are a lot of adults using it just because they enjoy creating with it, we do see the same thing with Scratch. I think one of the things that's disappointed me for several years now is the degree to which open source software just doesn't get taught in schools, but it does feel as though Scratch is much more widely adopted. Yeah, well, we've been very you know, excited at how you know, it's you know, gotten out to the world. Initially, it was being used mostly in homes and some after school centers. Uh, Partly, we didn't provide much support for teachers in the beginning, and usually there's a slower adoption rate in schools. In the last year or so, it definitely has started to be used more commonly in schools. Uh, it's still by usually the more adventurous teachers, the innovative teachers, uh, but we've, there's a lot more you know, workshops now for teacher professional development where they're integrating Scratch into different you know, project-based activities that they're doing in classrooms. We've also set up a separate website called Scratch Ed. It's specifically for educators who are using Scratch where they can share their ideas with each other, share lesson plans, curriculum guides, and even just the stories of how they're using Scratch. I also make, want to make sure to give a shout out to all my graduate students. A lot of the projects that I'm talking about, the people who are really putting it together are the graduate students in the group. The Scratch website was, you know, the, the real lead person on that was Andres Monroe Hernandez, one of my graduate students. The Scratch Ed website, Karen Brennan has taken the lead on that. Uh, and a lot of other students in the group, uh, Eric Rosenbaum, Jay Silver, Rick Rose Roke, uh, you know, Shaimindu Daskaptu, you know, all of them have been you know, great contributors to all of these projects. So we're going to switch to Q&A at this point. If you have a question for Mitch, please put it in the chat or feel free to raise your hand. That's the hand with the green up arrow at the bottom of your participant window. If you do raise your hand, we can give you the microphone. While we're waiting for questions to come in, uh, talk to me a little bit about the gender gap. Uh, well, I think one thing that we've been very you know, concerned about, you know, I think in, if you go to most computer science classes, there's a you know, depressingly you know, large gender gap. A small percentage of the participants are, are, are girls and women. Uh, so I think it's one thing we've tried to think a lot about in a lot of the work that we've done. As we've developed Scratch, we've specifically tried to make it so it would be appealing across genders. 
as we think about what type of projects to highlight and sample projects, we think about that. Similarly, with the work we've done in robotics, one of the themes in our work on crickets was to see how we could have projects that would be appealing across gender lines. Uh, sadly, like a lot of the work on after-school centers with traditional robotics, again, is male-dominated. But we see if we provide the right type of support, the right sample projects, the right you know, uh, thematic support around it, that we can appeal across gender lines. So Mitch, I don't know if it was your video went off um, or if anybody else has lost it, but I've lost your video. Scott Garrigan, I'm giving you the mic. You can turn your mic on using the microphone button at the lower left of your screen. Okay. Uh, Mitch, I, I understand there's been uh, a development of Scratch in the iPad that Apple hasn't approved, maybe because Scratch is still tied to its squeak small talk base. Uh, how do you see that uh, issue evolving uh, as, as time goes on, particularly Scratch's current uh, connection with the Squeak small talk base? Yeah. Well, the issue is not specifically because of Squeak and small talk. The issue is that on the iPad and the iPhone, you're not allowed to download executable code. So we did have a version of Scratch for the iPhone and the iPad and which would let you download Scratch projects from the Scratch website, but Apple doesn't let you download executable code. Uh, so they ended up, although it was on the web, it was on the in the App Store, the Apple App Store for a while. They then took it down. Uh, but as those are Apple rules. I would hope that at some point Apple would find a, you know, agree to change that. Uh, right now, on like on Android tablets. You know there are ways you can now run Scratch. So I think it's you know just a, it's it's more of a you know, decision Apple made that hopefully they'll change. Uh, but you know we are working on ways that you can you know run uh, Scratch on uh, you know different different types different sorts of devices. We'd want it to run on a wide range of platforms. One thing that we are working on now for our next generation of Scratch, we're gonna have a version of Scratch that runs entirely in the browser. So that you'll be able to author in the browser. Uh, so you won't have to download a, a separate application. And we hope that will also make Scratch uh, more seamless in the way that you can use it on different platforms. It still won't resolve the issue on the iPad, uh, but maybe in the future you know, there will be ways of doing that. Uh, Chrissy has her hand up. But before I go to Chrissy, uh, Bill asked a question in the chat. I'm interested in getting K to five grade students to use questions as a tool for learning. Could you discuss how your tools help students to be better at questioning? Yeah. Uh, well, again, I think that a big part of it is how the tools are introduced. The tools themselves, you know, don't do that. Uh, but I think that they provide a great opportunity for educators to use the tools to get kids to be asking questions. I think it's just generally true of a lot of design-based activities are great for sparking questions because as you start making things, it sort of it then inspires lots of questions. Why did it work that way? How can I make it differently? Why did you do things that way when you start looking at each other? So when you make something, it provides something for people to start talking about and raising lots of questions. So I see that in general, the design-based learning approach I think is a very good approach for uh, engaging people and asking questions and learning through the questions that they're asking. So I would encourage using, I think our tools are well designed for that design-based learning approach that then can support uh, having kids be able to raise questions. And certainly when we make use of our tools, we're always emphasizing that, that a big part of what we're looking for kids to do is not just sort of you know, problem solving, but problem finding for them to come up with the problems to be, you know, that are of interest to them and the questions that they want to solve. Chrissy, I've given you the microphone. To turn your mic on, click on the microphone icon at the lower left of your screen. All right, thank you. Um, my question is, I'm doing a project right now with a group of students where they're creating electronic children's stories, and they're working collaboratively in groups of three or four. Um, and I've tied their project to, we talk about um, 
Gardner's theory of multiple intelligences and how um, multimedia authoring software like Scratch um, allows students to um, use those talents that they are best at when contributing to the project. And we've broken up roles as far as you have an artist, you might be an illustrator, you, know, you might be an illustrator, you might be a narrator, you might be a programmer, you might be, you know, there's all sorts of roles that they can take on. Um, but what I've seen is students, they're very motivated to do what they do best. My fear is that they're not improving on areas that they need to improve on. So for example, those that maybe are a little fearful of the programming side um, are not going to improve on that because they're happy with making their contributions at Did we lose the audio just went off for me. Yeah. But I think I heard enough of the question to be able to respond. Uh, well, first of all, I agree. Giving you know opportunities for uh, people from all different styles and all different you know learning styles and different interests to be able to participate is very important. And in all the things that we design, one of our one of the, the slogans we use is many paths, many styles. We want our tools to support many paths of inquiry and discovery and many styles of learning. Uh, so, you know, and I think in Scratch, we really want to make it so that kids of all different styles uh, of learning, whether you want to sort of plan things out or just tinker around and let things grow out of the tinkering to support all of those different learning styles. But I definitely agree with Christy. You don't want people to just get locked into one area of expertise. But I think if you provide these, you know, multiple avenues and multiple pathways of things that you can do, it, there are ways to make it easy for people to start exploring and experimenting with the things that have been less familiar to them and they're less comfortable with. Let me just tell a personal story that, was, that, that, was, that helped me see this. When we were first getting started with our Lego robotics work, I was working closely with a colleague named Steve Ako. And Steve was a great toy designer, and he could build anything out of Lego bricks. And actually, I felt more comfortable on the computer. I was pretty good at programming the computer, but I wasn't so good at building in the physical world. So Steve and I were a pretty good team, but as we first connected the Lego physical materials with the logo programming, Steve would make these incredible physical you know, creations and write a very short program to make it move. And I would make a very simple, you know, physical construction and write a long, complex program that would react in all sorts of different ways. So the, you, we both had a way of getting an entry point, and each of us could start with something we were comfortable with, but Steve was able to use his base of being comfortable in the physical world to start experimenting more in the programming world. And I was able to start from my base of being comfortable in programming to start experimenting and exploring in the less familiar world of physical building. So by bringing these different forms of design together, it not only gave us both a way to contribute, but a way for us to start where we were comfortable and made it easier for us to experimenting and learning part of each other's world. And I think we'd like to see this, we'd see the same thing happening, you know, as kids start working with Scratch. They'll start doing it in different ways and some will focus more on the graphics or the animation or bringing in music others with programming, but then if they want to start working on you know, more advanced programs, they'll start gradually adding in the other elements to it, and that's really what we're hoping for. Mitch, I've wondered, as you've talked about students' use of these tools, it, it feels often in these conversations that teachers live in a sort of a very parallel world to the students, often constrained uh, sort of in this obedience culture. Do you see teachers using Scratch or some of these other programs in ways that help them kind of expand their own boundaries? Well, certainly when we do workshops with teachers for teacher professional development, a key element is for them to get involved of creating their own things. Because if they're going to be leading a, a classroom like this, they need to be creators themselves. You know, I think that you know, sometimes we, you know, people talk about the apprenticeship model you know, of learning. And it's important, probably the most important thing, if we want kids to grow up 
learning to design and create and to be good learners, we want them apprenticing with people who are also good designers, creators, and learners. So I do think it's important for teachers to be able to you know, do these things as well as a way of getting a better appreciation for supporting young people as they're doing these things. At our computer clubhouses, we found many of the best mentors were people who came from you know, creative backgrounds, who have artists or musicians who are accustomed to creating things. In some ways, it was easier for them to start to learn the technology than to have someone who just knew the technology but wasn't as good in the creative expression. Uh, so I think we really want to have the mentors and educators be very comfortable with their own creative expression so they can then support young people in their creative expression. Mitch, uh, Debbie asked, how do teachers convince administrators that these tools have many educational uses? Uh, well, again, it's a, it's, a, it's a challenge oftentimes. It depends on, you know, for different administrators, you probably need to say different things. Uh, also, the many different uses, one, some of the uses that I get most excited about things scratch in elementary schools where you have a teacher who teaches across all the disciplines and they have the young people learning about scratch and then they're able to use it in everything, whether they're doing a book report, they can use scratch. If they're doing a simulation for the science class, they can use scratch. So they, there it becomes clear you can use it across all of the disciplines. So I think if you just you know, it becomes obvious there by demonstration of how it can be used in so many different ways. It's sometimes more challenging when you get to middle school where it's usually divided with different teachers for each discipline, where a lot of times the teachers aren't, it's not as clear to them that it's worth the investment of helping the young people, you know, the students learn scratch in order to just be able to make a contribution to their discipline work. So I think it's easier if, you know, if there's a type of fluency the same way that if social studies classes had to introduce you to writing with regular language, it, would be a, it, would be a, it wouldn't happen. But since kids learn to write as they grow up, they then use it across all the disciplines. We see programming in the same way, that hopefully kids would learn to express themselves through programming and then it can be used across the disciplines. So I often, and I would tell administrators, that same analogy to writing, that, you know, Writing is something that once you learn how to write, you can leverage it across all, many diff all the different disciplines and it helps you learn everything. You see, you're not just learning how to write, but you're forming a foundation that helps you learn everything else. The same thing with programming. It's not just about learning programming. It's that once you learn programming, it can help you learn everything else. We've got just a couple of minutes left and we've got more good questions than we're going to have time for. Uh, quickly, could girls' choice in computer games give us hints on how to increase appeal? Uh, well, I do think, you know, some things, I'm not an expert in exactly what type of video games different kids use, but I do think that, like, some of the things that we see on the Scratch website and also in the things that we've done in, in the robotics area, try to make sure that there's uh, bright opportunities to allow people to develop a narrative, so you're doing things in a full context. Uh, like we've seen in, uh, when kids are doing robotics projects, there's some kids who are happy just building, uh, if they're doing an amusement park, they're happy to just build a Ferris wheel. Where there are other kids who want to have a whole story about a day at the amusement park, and they're only interested in building a merry-go-round with their kids to get on the merry-go-round, and there's a story of a family spending a day. So allowing kids to develop a narrative around the work I think is one important way of, of engaging a broader range of kids. So not just learning the specific technical details and the concepts, but embedding it in a narrative is one approach that we've seen used in our work in both robotics and in scratch creations that we find is useful for engaging a wide range of kids. Mitch, thanks so much for coming on. I really appreciate it. I'm using the clapping icon now to thank you. We are at the top mm -hmm. of the hour. It is a I think is it um, nine o'clock there? So you're. It's nine uh, o'clock here. We've made a promise to you to keep it to an hour. Really appreciate it. Thanks mm -hmm. to you. Thanks to Illuminate Learn Central for helping to support the program. Karen, I'm sorry we won't have time for any more questions. Uh, any final words, Mitch? Uh, well, again, 
I think what's, if we're going to bring about change, we need to build community. So it's great to be getting a chance to talk to all of you out there. And I, you know, I do think that what we need to do is all be able to sh keep sharing ideas and stories with one another so we can you know, collectively be able to you know, help shift those mindsets and help be able to bring new ways of thinking about learning and education. Thank you so much for that. Thanks for coming. Uh, uh, for those of you who stick around, I will put the link to his website uh, in the chat in just one second, and it does have contact information. I uh, really appreciate your, your being here, Mitch, and appreciate your taking the time tonight. Okay. Thank you very much, Steve. Thank you. Thanks, everybody, for coming. We'll go ahead and turn the recording off and uh, give you a few minutes to um, finish up your chatting, and then we'll kick you out of the room so the recording will process. <laughs>